Okay, it's fine. So young people, what is this? A balloon. And what color is this balloon? What color? It's blue. It's not blue? It sure looks blue to me. It's red? Well, what if I just feel like it's blue today? Does that mean it's blue? No. It means it's red. You're right. This is a red balloon. Now we'll see if that red balloon is going to stay there for me. And what is this? A Bible. A Bible. You know, there are some people that will tell you this is just another book. But I'm going to spend the next 30 to 35 minutes trying to convince all of your family that it's more than just a book. I'm going to do my very best to convince them that this is the Word of God. And so no matter what anybody tries to tell me, this is the word of God. Just like somebody might try to tell you this is a blue balloon. When they try to tell you this is anything but the word of God, you know it is the word of God. So would you stand with me, young people? And let's pray. Heavenly Father, you love these young men and women even more than we do. And that's kind of hard to imagine. So, Father, we ask you to protect them and guide them each and every moment, every day of their life. And, Father, our prayer is that they will know without a shadow of a doubt, much more important than what color balloon is, that this book, your book, the Word of God, the Bible, is true. It is active, it is alive, it is living, and it will guide and it will change their life if they let you. God, we pray they let you. Thank you for giving them to us. Help us to do our best to protect them and guide them, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. You guys are dismissed. We'll see you in a little bit. So my wife and I have become fairly predictable over 36 years. I have my jobs to do in our daily routine. She has hers. And it kind of throws us both out of balance if either of us changes something up, especially when it comes to finding things in our new home. I know we've been there for a year now, for a little bit over a year, but somebody keeps moving things. And I'm not going to say who because somebody threw me under the bus last week. And you know who you are. But no, God's got, God just kind of scrambles things around and I'll call her and ask her, where did you put that? And she's like, I don't remember. I'll find it when I get home. <laughs> it's like, okay, fine, okay, fine. No, it, that's not too tough. But here's something I think is funny. I've not always been a coffee drinker, okay? And I know that some of you, that's really bad. But there was a number of years in our marriage that I just really didn't care for it. I didn't drink it. 
And she did. And so coffee was her deal. She got to a place where she decided what she liked better than, than ground up beans, ground up grounds out of a can. She wanted fresh beans to grind every day and, and put them in. She just thought the coffee was better. Well, that's fine. Then we went through the process of finding the, the coffee beans that she liked the best. And uh, that worked pretty good until we moved to Idaho from Oregon. Because in Oregon, we had this coffee place. She really liked it, and it was her favorite. For a year or two, whenever we would go over to visit, we would buy several bags of it and freeze it. But pretty soon, that just got unrealistic. And so she had to find another bean to, to grind to have her coffee. And then she decided there was too much caffeine. So she decided to find a coffee that she liked, that she could go half caffeinated, half decaf. And she found that there was a, a large store that she kind of liked their coffee. She could buy it in two-pound bags. And, and then she would take those two-pound bags, one of each, mix them in a bowl, mix them all together, and then she would make her coffee out of that every morning. Then I started drinking coffee. And then she started working full time. And so, I, just to be a nice husband, she had had a long week, just a, a lot of issues with people at work. And uh, when you're the manager of an emergency room that's seeing 115 to 120 patients a day, it can be kind of insane. And so I thought, well, I'll make the coffee for her. Well, she was thrilled. She was grateful. And she's like, thank you so much. I thought, well, I got a lot of points out of that. So I'm going to do it again. So I did that for two or three days in a row. And, and then we kind of went back. And then she goes, you know, I really think you make better coffee than I do. Is there any way I could talk you into doing this for me on a every daily basis? I'm thinking, yeah, there are days you're leaving here at 4.30 in the morning. I don't want to get up at 4.30 in the morning to make your coffee. I said, finally, it's like, okay, if you'll let me make it the night before, and then you can either get up and turn it on before you shower, or we can set it on the automatic brew time. We'll do it. So that's what we've been doing ever since. So we have our routine. And that was all working really, really good until the store we were buying our coffee at, they quit selling the decaf beans. We're like, rut row. And, okay. We finally found some in Boise. So it's really pathetic. I, I will admit this. We will go up there and buy five bags, 10 pounds of coffee at a time, of both decaf and calf, so that we can put them in our freezer and bring them out as needed so that we get the coffee we want when we want it. Now, I know that's silly. I, I know that's silly. But, but I, I'm kind of guessing that everybody here has a similar story. That would be my guess. We like what we like, and we're spoiled to live in a world, in a country, where we can generally get what we want. Freedom of choice is a luxury that we sometimes take for granted until we're faced with a choice that it's no longer there or available to us. And there's no doubt that a lot of the frustration and anxiety for many this last several months has been they can't get what they want when they want. Most of us haven't had to deal with shortages like that in a long time, and many never have. We like what we like. We want it when we want it. So just for fun, I thought, let's do a little bit of a survey this morning. Fast food. How many root for McDonald's? You guys are good people. Okay. How many Taco Bell? Okay. How many Burger King? Okay. How many Arby's? Where's the beef? Okay. Well, that's Wendy's. It's not. Sorry, anyway, okay. All right. Kind of a good mix there. You're, 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 you're pretty good mix there. Okay. How about this? Grocery stores. How many go for Smith's? How many go for Ridley's? Just a few of you. Okay. Okay. How many Stokes? Okay. Walmart. Woo, 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 woo. I almost didn't put that up there because, you know, it's like, all right. All right, one more. Pizza. How many Pizza Hut? How many Doc's Pizza? How many Pooter's Pizza? A bunch of you. How about Little Caesars? How about Maxie's? All of the above? All of the above? Okay. I had to throw Maxie's in. I know we don't have one locally, but I'm sorry. I used to, and, and I'm sorry. That's what I grew up with. Uh, we all have our favorites. That's the point I wanted us to make. In our world, 
there are usually more than four options to choose from. And none of those opinions are right or wrong. Well, no, they're not. It's just what you prefer. But here's the problem. We live in a world, not just a nation, we live in a world where people look upon faith and religion much like we do a, a, a visit to the grocery store or to the mall. We want and we expect several options to choose from. Now when it comes to clothes or food or cars or music or sports teams or stores or banks, houses or just about anything else, there's a lot of room for opinion and choice and that's all great. But when it comes to God, the choices are narrowed. In fact, the choices are not only narrowed, they're limited. The Bible makes exclusive claims about God and about his plan for mankind. God doesn't claim to be a God. He claims to be the God. And the Bible doesn't claim to be just a holy book. It claims to be the holy book. And that's hard for many people to accept. We like and we want our options. And the claim to be the only word of God, that seems arrogant and narrow-minded. This is a special book. I brought with me three special books from my house this morning. The first two were gifts from my, my dad's mom, my grandma Morris. And the first one she gave me when I was probably 11 or 12, and I love to read. And uh, it's a Zane Gray book that she had, but it's called The Shortstop. And it's about baseball, which wasn't normally what Zane Gray wrote about. Usually it was westerns and stuff like that. But she gave me this book, and, 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 I, and, and she wrote in it, Andy, I want you to have this book of mine. My father gave it to me. And she gave this back to me gave it to me back in 1974. And so I've read it, I don't know how many times, just because it's sentimental that way. But it's, it's still very special to me. The other book she gave me is much older. It's called, the, and I've got a lot of old books, but these are the two that are the most special to me, The Young Fireman of Lakeville. And this is a book that was her dad's book. And, and so... Just a, a, a fictional story of, of teenage boys, but it's special to me. But the third book that I brought this morning that I wanted to share with you, I'm betting you can guess what it is. I had to put the cover on it. It's a Bible. And it's the Bible that my mom and dad gave me my first year of Bible college. And uh, I don't use it anymore because... Quite honestly, <laughs> it's fallen apart. But the only time I use it when I, I think, where did I put those notes? I have to go back in and look. I, I had to chuckle because I looked in here and, and uh, I've got my notes from a wedding I did back in 1999. So <laughs> it kind of made me chuckle. It's like, okay. But um, a special book. The Bible is a special book. Somewhere, and I couldn't find it, I have my dad's Bible. And when he passed away back in 1988, on September 11th, um, I was blessed to receive his, his Bible. The Bible is a special book. But here's the thing. If the Bible is true, and God is who he says he is, When it comes to faith, when it comes to religion, there's no other option. But it's like it claims to be the book. Now, it claims to be the word of God, his revelation of himself and his plans for mankind to mankind. And I'll admit when it comes to this question, I have a predetermined bias. I have an opinion that uh, I believe it's true. And I'm going to do my best to back up that conviction and why I've come to that. But I want to take a few moments to consider this. And I, and I, want, to, I want to watch a video with you for a second. And I think it'll help you understand my comments to our children uh, just a few minutes ago. This is a red balloon. 
It's true, it's red, we all know our colors. The absolute truth is that this balloon is red. No, it's not. That's green. What? This right here is a green balloon. That is the prettiest yellow balloon. <laughs> yellow? This is red. Yeah, come over here. No, it's green. It's red! Yeah, I know, it's a red balloon. <laughs> hey, will you look at it from my point of view, please? What? Hey, nice blue balloon. Blue. It's green! Green? It's red. What? Why are you saying it's red when it's blue, huh? It's what? totally purple from here! Purple? Okay, you know what? Let's just settle this once and for all, okay? Where are you going? Hey, what color is this balloon? I only see in black and white. Okay. Hey, Mark, what color... There is no balloon. This is ridiculous! Hey, I know what the problem is. Look, uh, my mom taught me that this was blue. But, um, you know, then she said this is red and green, yellow, you know, and on and on. <laughs> okay, I get that your mom taught you that that was blue, but, I mean, that's not the truth. Whoa, why are you talking bad about his mom? Yeah. I'm not. Listen, I respect your mother. Thank you. And the way she raised you. She taught you that was blue. Our moms taught us that it was red. That's the way it goes. I thought you said it was green. It is green. See, I'm smart. I went to college. And in college, I learned all these different <laughs> theories about color. Really? And my color professors who have doctorates in color... Do you have a doctorate in color? Uh, no. It shows. Okay? <laughs> they can't even agree on one theory of color, so you have to look at all the different theories and pick which one works best for you. And green is great for me. That makes sense. Thank you. No, you can't just pick whatever color fits your life the best. Red is red. Okay, do you know the word intolerant? Yeah. Because that's what you're being right now. All right, you're shoving your opinion down my throat. Okay, it's not my opinion, it's the truth. <laughs> hold on, hold on. All we're saying is that we need to stop arguing about trivial things. Like truth. You know, the funny thing about truth is, it's true, whether you believe it or not. Red balloon. Whether we believe it or not, doesn't change that. Last week we started a series of messages, Sometimes I Wonder, and we asked ourselves some difficult questions of faith that mankind often finds themselves wondering about. Why am I here? It's to bring glory and honor to God. To be in relationship with God. This week our series continues. We ask another simple question. Is the Bible true? This is the word of God. Psalm 119, 105 is very clear. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, where does that light ultimately lead our path to? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Is the Bible true? I have over 15 books in my library in my office exploring evidences and proofs of why we can believe the Bible and the principles and promises it makes about God. And that's just the physical books. That's not counting the books I have electronically. We could spend hours, we could spend days, weeks, and even years exploring the evidences and the proofs of these well-known scholars. But this morning, I just want to simplify it just a little bit. I want us to look at why I believe the Bible is true from external evidence. Okay? This is evidence that's outside of the written pages of the Bible. And the first area that we look to for evidence is history, geography, science, and archaeology. They all provide support and proof that authenticate that the Bible is true and it's accurate. They're full of logical, well-reasoned evidences that help support and prove that this is the Word of God. There are many well-formed arguments reasonable explanations from various disciplines of study that support that these words that are written on these pages are true. And there are several instances where non-believers have set out to, to show that this can't be true. They have gathered evidence, they have gathered, they've studied, they've researched, and the majority of them have come to the Christian faith because they were convicted by the evidence that it is true. There's a few that haven't. And yet even in their writings, they acknowledge that there's never been a more 
archaeological sound and accurate book written than the Bible. Some of the coins that have been found, some of the, the names that are given, history has proven this actually existed. Well, in addition to these external evidences, there's the original manuscripts. The manuscripts and the fragments of manuscripts that are found from the Old Testament and a, with the New Testament, over 24,000 either whole or partial fragments dating to within 25 years of the last writings being concluded. Within 25 years, 24,000 pieces of evidence that bring us to the point that we can trust this. But what's most, the, the next, the second most proof, wor proof worthy book is a book of fiction. It has 600 manuscripts of pieces and fragments of it that help bring out that what we read when we hold that book in our hand today is what was originally written. 600. And it dates within 500 years of that book being written. We have 24,000 pieces of evidence that are within 25 years of the last person writing. And, and the crazy part of it is, is, is that while those, there's a few minor differences, they just deal with minor spelling errors or punctuation issues. They do not change the meaning of what was written. Then there's personal testimony of eyewitnesses. The last recorded words of the New Testament were written and they were in existence before all of the eyewitnesses of those recorded events had passed away. People were still living when these words were being spread to the local churches. And here's the thing, if, those were, if these accounts were not true, if these words were not true, if they were just made up stories by delusional followers, there were those who were there, including the Jewish leaders as well as the Roman authorities and scholars, that it would have done everything they could to prove that this isn't true. But they didn't because they couldn't. Uh, there were people that tried. There were people that tried. And much like today, there were people that put things out there that weren't true, but they packaged it in such a way that it sounded true. But anybody who looked at it with a critical, thinking, logical, reasoning mind would be able to say, your evidence doesn't weigh up to this evidence. I'm sorry. We've got to look at the evidence. Well, those are just a few of the outside, the external evidences that this is the word of God. What about what we gain from the internal, the inside sources of the Bible. The reality is that this book does not need you or me or anyone else to defend it. It doesn't. It stands on its own. It does a great job of that. In fact, I have been privileged over the years numerous times to get to lead someone to Christ who the words of God had led them to a point of, of, of belief of, of desiring to repent. To, to, they were sorry for what they had done that separated them in their relationship from God and, and they wanted to be a child of God and I got the privilege. They're like, Andy, I gotta be baptized. And it's like, okay, well, let's talk about that. We talked about it and I said, yep, you're right. Let's do it. The word of God can defend itself. The apostle Paul in his letter to the Timothy, the second letter he wrote said, all scripture is God-breathed and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All scripture. The writer of the book of Hebrews wrote, For the word of God is living and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So the Bible makes some claims about itself that are pretty powerful in both the Old and New Testament. And these are claims that skeptics and non-believers love to attack in their attempt to discredit and to say, oh, it's just another book. Yet time and time again, the Bible has stood up. The accusations are not strong enough. They do not negate. They do not refute the word of God. They can't. So, so one of the greatest strengths of the internal evidence of the Bible is its claims. They've been proven over and over again. Another evidence from inside the Bible is the unity. 
It was written over a period of 1,500 years on three different continents by over 40 different people in three different languages. And these people that wrote it, these 40 people, they were so diverse, they were kind of like our church. It was all over the place of who they were, where they came from, their background, their education, everything else. It was great. I love that God gives us that because I think he gives us a picture of the church in that. But in that, 1,500 years worth of stuff, three continents, three languages, it's consistent from beginning to end. Now there are things that, well, wait a minute, that doesn't match up, but when we look at it, oh, oh, it does. It does. There's logical and it's reasonable. So the unity of the scripture in itself, that's pretty pretty crazy. Have you ever played the game uh, telephone or telegraph? You have six people standing in a row here and you whisper in the first person's ear a message, then they turn and whisper it into the next person's ear and by the end of the time when they get down to the last person, that person says it to everybody and it's always kind of interesting to see how much the original words have changed from what was given toward the end. Just little tiny bits here and there. And that's with six people. 1,500 years. Three languages, three continents, 40 people. And it's still consistent. The unity is a huge evidence to its truth. Another evidence inside is the prophecy that was fulfilled. One of the most powerful evidences of God's hand guiding and crafting this book together is the hundreds of prophecies that were given in the Old Testament, hundreds, even thousands of years in advance of them taking place and happening and being fulfilled in the New Testament. I'm sorry, that's way too overwhelming to be just coincidence. And the final piece of the internal evidence that we see is the Bible's honesty. One of the final pieces. The word of God is not sugar-coated. He is not trying to spin things to make God look good. God, the Holy Spirit, gives the good and the bad. And yet, it's still consistent to share God's plans and purposes for us. And for all who wear his name. Think about the books that other faiths use for their foundational texts. Every other faith outside of Christ has their holy books. And yet very, very seldom do you see any of those books ever saying anything negative about the purposes or the plans or the people, the heroes of the faith that are chronicled within those books. Yet God's word allows us to see the breaking of relationship with Adam and Eve in the garden with God. It allows us to see Abraham's fear and dishonesty. It allows us to see Moses' pride. It allows us to see David's lust. And in the New Testament, we see the leader's strengths as well as their weaknesses. And the problems that some of those early churches had. God doesn't try to hide any of that from us. He doesn't try to hide the warts and the blemishes of the faith records. Maybe because he knows if we see that and that he still works and is still supreme, that it's going to encourage us that in spite of us, he's got a plan and a purpose and will use us. He's got room for us in his plans and his purposes. We don't have to be. We won't be perfect but this tells us that he is. And that's good news. That's good news for us. There's one last evidence that comes from within this book. Another strong evidence of the truth and the power of God's word. And it's sitting all around you. It's simply the impact in people's lives. Look around this room. There's close to 100 people sitting here this morning that have been impacted by our living proof of the power and the truth of God's word. And you multiply that countless number of believers all over the world that bear witness to the power and the authority of the Bible. It's pretty impressive when you stop to think about it. I have heard and I have read at this point in my life probably thousands of testimonies of people who have been impacted by and bear witness to the power and the authority of God's word. And it's impressive. And, and, and there's one especially that has struck me, and, and I remember even, it's still today, I heard it years ago, but it still reminds me of how incredible God is. It was toward the close of World War II. And the soldiers, as they worked their way across Okinawa, 
They found villages of unbelievable poverty, ignorance, filth, squalor. I mean, it was really bad. Except for one. Shimabuku was a small, obscure community, and it was different from the rest. As the soldiers came through the streets, they saw homes and streets that were clean. They saw villagers that were poised and cultured, a high level of health, happiness, intelligence, and prosperity. And they started asking themselves, why was Shim Shimabuku different? As they talked to the people in the village, they learned some important truths. 30 years previous to the American army coming, an American missionary on his way to Japan had stopped there. And before he moved on to, Ch to Japan, he led two of the men in the village to faith in Christ, and he left them a Bible. And from that day on, the people of that community had seen no other missionary. There was no other visit from any other Christian person or group. But in those 30 years, the inhabitants of that community, that village, made the Bible come alive. Those two men that were converted to be followers of Christ, they taught the villagers the truth of God's word until everyone in that village became a Christ follower. Then came that day in 1945 when the American army came to town. Clarence Hall was a man that was a war correspondent at that time, and he was with the army as he came through town. And he wrote the following words. I strolled through Shimabuku one day with a tough old army sergeant. And as we walked, he turned to me and he whispered hoarsely, I can't figure it out. This kind of people coming out of only a Bible and a couple old guys who wanted to live like Jesus? Then the sergeant said something that was infinitely penetrating in his observation. Maybe we've been using the wrong kind of weapon to make the world over. Think about that. I think he was right. Time had dimmed. The, 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 the folks of the village, they really didn't remember a whole lot of the missionary. And even the two men that had been led to Christ couldn't remember his name. But they remembered this parting statement he made to them. He, they said, study this book well. It will give you strong faith in the Creator God, and when your faith in God is strong, everything is strong. This is a red balloon. And you can call it whatever color you want to. But reality is, this is a red balloon. I knew it was going to do that. I looked for it and I didn't find it. Anybody know what this is? A tuning fork, a musical tuning fork. And I used to have one, but guess what? I couldn't find it. That wasn't Debbie's fault, though, I have to admit. It's a fork, it's a tuning fork, and when you strike it against an object or against your leg, the vibrations make a sound. It emits a tone which is the musical note we call A. And it doesn't matter where you hit it, when you hit it, when you strike it, it's going to give you the note, the tone of the musical note A. It was an A yesterday, it's an A today, and it will be an A a thousand years from now. You can call it anything you want, but that note, that tone, is still... An A. This is the Bible. The Word of God. You can despise it, you can deny it, you can distort it, you can dissect it, and you can disregard it. Or, you can read it, you can study it, you can delight in it, you can hide it in your heart, and you can defend it. But make no mistake, whatever you do or do not do, the words of this book are eternal and they're true. Believe it or not. Somebody once made the statement, I sure don't understand this book, but I'll go to my grave standing upon it. My prayer this morning 
is that you and I will do the same thing. Father, thank you for giving us a light into our faith to to guide our path that leads us to you, that leads us to Jesus. Lord, the whole entire Old Testament exists to point us to Jesus. Even from the beginning chapters of the book of Genesis, we see that. This is not accidental. You were intent and you were on purpose. So Father, help us not only to be convicted of this truth, of these words, but to let it light our path and guide us. Lord, help us to hide your, your words in our heart. So that no matter what happens, we stand upon it. Lord, this is going to impact our here and now, and it's going to impact our eternity. Father, in the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at who you are as God, our Father. We're going to be looking at who Jesus is. We're going to look at the Holy Spirit. But God, it all begins and it ends in the words of this book. The Bible, your holy word. God, help us to take it and let that light shine so that others who are caught up in darkness, they can find their way to you so they too are no longer walking in the darkness, but they have the light of life. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Folks, if you're here this morning and you have questions about any of this, or you just need somebody to pray with you because you're going through a tough time, grab me, grab one of our leaders. We want to share with you. We want to love you. We want to encourage you. That's why we're here. Grab the person sitting by you. They're going to help you and they're going to love you. That's why we're here. A bunch of broken people that have an amazing perfect, holy God. Let's go take that light. Let's follow that light as we lead our paths and let's share that light with others. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.